Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and with me today is my friend, Jen Vertinen, who's a coach, mentor, speaker, and writer who encourages people to share the hard stories and heal the places that hurt. Jen knows the power of telling your story. Hers comes from an emotionally abusive childhood that we'll get into a little bit here and knows that the shame starts to fade away. Jen's somebody that I've known for several years. We first connected in an online entrepreneurial kind of a group uh, where she was a coach. And then she and I crossed paths again recently in a Facebook group for women podcasters because Jen has started her own new show called Going There, which is a space for intimate conversations with people who are working to heal the places that hurt. And I knew when I saw when I saw her pop up there, I knew that I wanted to have her as a guest on A Healthy Curiosity because I think it's really important to not just hear from the experts and the people who theoretically know stuff and create this artificial boundary between like the experts and, and everyone else, but, but really the fact that to honor the fact that we've all learned stuff on our path. And a lot of times, the more we have a sense of our particular stories and what we've particularly had to, to heal from, like the obstacles in our path are also the growth opportunities. And so since I really respect and admire people who are willing to show up authentically and not just present this facade that like they're perfect and shiny and like everyone else is struggling with problems, but you know, they can trust you because you have all the answers. I knew I wanted to, to feature Jen on the show. So I'm really grateful to have her here because she is so open and willing to, to talk about her journey and to, and to hopefully invite us into the power of healing that she's discovered in, in what she calls self-mothering. So Jen, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey from being a coach and a mentor and a speaker and a writer to, to, to somebody who's, who's creating this space to have these kinds of intimate conversations. <laughs> How long do we have? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 47 and I would say I really haven't gotten my shit together until, can I swear? Yeah, go for oh, it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Figured it out, so to speak, until the most, uh, the last couple of years. And that's really, there's a whole lot that went into that, but it's just, I've been on this trajectory of learning how to give myself what I need through that healing process. And through that, I've always been known as the warrior, the protector, the mama bear, especially for my software development teams. And I just thought, you know, I've been looking for women, mother figures in my life, if you will. And I've always been that for others. And so, but more from that professional software development background, why don't I take that and, and nurture another side of myself, which is to give that that side of me to others. Um, it helps me heal a little bit. It helps others heal a little bit. And, you know, through that, we all feel a little bit less alone, which is really what I'm trying to do. Uh, very selfishly, it helps me feel less alone. And that's the thing is like, you can't really connect without being part of that connection, right? right? Like right. you can't touch without being touched. And, and so creating a space for other people to share their stories and being able to reflect on your own, it really does give us an opportunity to transcend them. So, and you use the word mama bear, which is, which is an interesting word because when we think of mothering, <laughs> right, when we think of mother energy, it's not always mama bear that we think of first, right? Like that, <laughs> <it's just> that, <laughs> that we might think of like an earth mother who's like all giving, all loving, all supportive, and who will feed you soup when it's yeah, cold, you know, like, and who will just like take care of you. So, so this mother, this mama bear archetype, what's, mm -hmm. what's she all about? Oh God. I mean, she will put herself in harm's way. She will go to battle. She will roar up on her hind legs. I'm oh, just giving myself goosebumps here because I've been that person since I was about eight trying to protect my mom and my brother from my dad. And so it's just, I just have this, this strong huge image in my head of, of, like I said, just roaring up and being that, that warrior, but also that tender nurturer, because I'm both of those things. And for so long, I felt, or I thought my story was 
I wasn't a nurturing person. I have three children. I wasn't a nurturing mother. I'm not a woman that people want to have friends with. And and those, you know, those are my stories and they're they're not true despite how much I thought they were true. But it all goes back to this. I I can be both this strong, fierce warrior and the soft, safe, nurturing space. Well, and they really are the yin and the yang of the same yeah. archetype. Like in Hindu mythology, is it Durga who's like Durga, the you yeah, know yeah. Who, who's the kind of fierce protector that that ferocity that that I could almost feel as you were describing the, the yeah. role that you tragically had to play as an eight year old. But <laughs> Durga's is, my gal too. She's yeah, my, she's another archetype that I go to. Yeah, yeah. How do you work with her? Oh, geez, if I'm going into a meeting, if I feel like I'm going into battle, and again, a lot of this comes from my professional work, but I'm using it more and more in my personal life. It's my suit of armor. It's channeling what would Durga do in this instance that felt a little what would Jesus do? But, you know, what would Durga do? How would she go into this room full of people? How would she um, approach this conversation, a difficult conversation? Awesome. So yeah, and, and that, that's really, I think, what the inner version of, of the deities are, right? Is yeah. that there, there, are these, there are these flavors of power that we can tap into, that, that we can channel, so to speak, and bring out. So I'd love to hear a bit about, about your path and, and sort of what does it mean on a practical level to be the mama bear for yourself in, a, in the way that, mm. that, you never, that you never received? Yeah, you know, I feel like I kind of tripped and stumbled my way into doing that. And it's really, it's something I so naturally do for others. And I've always been very good at protecting my boundaries, um, taking care of myself, my needs, but not, not those emotional needs. And there was something that happened a couple of years ago with my mom and dad. And it just... It instilled in me once and for all that um, my mom, as as much as I love her, she didn't have my back. And, you know, again, I'm 47, so this is a lot of years in the making. And I think it freed me up to really once and for all go seek that for myself, even if it meant I needed to turn that mama bareness on, you know, inward and start to address and heal those parts of me that, that were broken. Yeah. And what was required for you in that process? For example, like, I think a lot of us can know that we have unmet emotional needs or like we've got places Mm. that we we haven't really spent much time there. And to fill that out for people, like what what did it look like to to finally address it or to finally be willing to go there? Yeah. You know, one of the things is is telling my husband, um, who's always been so supportive and, and there for me. When I need the hug of a spouse and when I need the hug of more of a parent figure, I didn't have that growing up and I so desperately wanted it for so long. I mean, that's just being a human and I'd find different ways to get it. One of those ways might be massage, just touch, right? But being able to communicate with my husband and say, I need the hug of of a parent, they're very different. So that's one example is being able to, again, articulate, this is what I need. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, it's this particular kind of hug right. and this particular kind of energy that needs right. to show up in this moment for me to get my needs met. Did he know what you meant? He totally did. He absolutely did because he's been by my side for, gosh, almost 20 years now. And yeah, he he, he knows what it's like and and what my parents, um, you know, the, the emotional, the, the, the trauma, if you will, he's, he's seen it firsthand. So, you know, that's just one example. Another example is I go back to the story that, and I have lots of evidence that I, I'm not a kind person. People don't like me. People don't want to be my friends because for the longest time I, I had no friends. I had lots of acquaintances. I smiled a lot. Um, people thought I had a very, you know, very social life and what have you. And, I didn't have anyone I could actually call and say, Hey, let's go get coffee. Let's go to yoga. Let's, let's just sit down and have some wine together or or a conversation. (laughs) And there was a lot of shame around that. You know, it's like, how can you be this seemingly normal person who feels so incredibly lonely? I think uh, that that's way more common than most people think. I think especially with women and especially women who are retired or perhaps like taking care of a spouse who's older or who is infirm. It's like, 
I see women's worlds get really small where like maybe they have people that they see at church or people that they see, you know, at, mm -hmm. depending on what their social life is like, they might, they might have a, a group of, of ladies that they connect with for lunch once a month or something, but they don't necessarily have that sense. They have like cronies and, and acquaintances, but not in like really solid friendships. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious, like, how did you go about upgrading <laughs> from, yeah, that dimension of your life and, and so that you could feel less alone? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, one of my blessings slash curses is I'm willing to just be awkward and say what's on my mind. Um, Such an one, awesome superpower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse. So we'll, yeah. But one day on Facebook, I just I felt, I don't know, my intuition said to do this. And I, I just I opened up and said, I'm lonely. And it wasn't the pity, pity, poor Jen, woe is me. It was I want to talk about this because I know for a fact I'm not alone and I'm I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of the impacts it has on me. Let's be lonely together. And through that, that was a couple of years ago, again, kind of around the time when my mom and, and dad stuff was really hitting the fan. But it was through that, you know, whether it was a private message or someone right on that post or, you know, texting me, they were like, hey, you know, let's go do something. And so it was through that and getting outside of my comfort zone and saying yes to those things it just it just started happening this episode of a healthy curiosity is brought to you by my basics of chinese medicine course you probably know your myers-briggs type and your astrological sign but do you know your chinese element knowing your element can help you recognize your superpowers your innate gifts and how to maximize them it can also help you avoid becoming a caricature of yourself. But better yet, when you understand your constitution, you can start to get to know which acupoints, meridians, foods, tastes, and activities are going to be medicine for you. And that, my friend, opens up a whole new world of self-care. Basics of Chinese Medicine is an eight-week deep dive into understanding your inner ecosystem. Registration is now open and we start October 18th. You'll learn how to confidently locate and use some of the most powerful acupoints and some essential oils that pair well with them, how to eat with the seasons, how to tell what a food or an herb does by how it tastes, as well as each internal organ's mystical powers, its emotional and psychological functions. To register, visit BrodyWelch.com, that's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H, and grab your spot. In hindsight, it's so silly, right? I said I was lonely. People are like, hey, let's go do something. We did something. Now I have friends. Like, if only, <laughs> if only it were that easy, right? Um, but at the, at the same time, it's like the hardest part of that whole sequence of events is having the courage to admit uh, it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Do I have a ton of friends? I mean, I have the right amount of people in my life, women and men, uh, supporting me. I'm always on the lookout for more, but I no longer have this deep, heart-aching loneliness. But That's... but the trauma of that is still there. You know, I can still, yeah. my body can still go to that place of that that loneliness. And sometimes it does, and I have to remind myself, no, I've I've done the work. I have these people. I need to reach out in those times tell them I love them. I'm thinking about them. That's an interesting thing too. Like that it requires, like if we're going to, if we're going to go from being somebody who thinks of herself as <laughs> the, the social pariah or the, yeah. you know, like the, yeah. somebody who's just like the, like the secret loner who everyone thinks is social <laughs> or whatever to yeah. going to be the person who actually is social and who actually takes time to, to cultivate friendships. Did that require different priorities in your life or, or doing things differently? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I would say for years, my husband has been encouraging me to go do this. So I didn't really have to shuffle around a lot. It was really m more of a mindset thing. And so instead of like, I still binge watch my favorite net Netflix shows, but maybe I and do. And why less shouldn't of you? It. Why shouldn't <laughs> But it's doing less of it, right? It's when, when someone asks to do something, um, and now I'm also doing the asking, which feels really good. And I love when people say yes, and I'm okay when they say no. But and, and it, if my introverted tendency or, you know, desire to hermit takes over, it's really checking in. Where is that coming from? Is it because I've been running myself ragged and I really need the rest? Okay, that's one thing. Or is it because I'm hermiting in a very in a not, you know, healthy way? That's another. And so, you know, drilling it down into those two decision points helps me make a move in in the way I want to. I, I love that you just brought that up because yes, like I have this conversation with people a lot. Like 
I just want to hole up and be alone yeah. and just get a lot of sleep and like watch a, you know, bad TV and like, <laughs> you know, make some comfort food. Like, does that mean I'm depressed? Right. <laughs> I'm like, how often do you do that? Right. Like, I mean, if this is if there could be just a really undermet need, if you're running yourself into the ground, it's like that most of us don't make time for for just downtime and for these things that might feel self-indulgent. But it can also, yes, like the, the, it's always the why that's more important than the what, right. in my opinion, exactly. right? Like, so like figuring out, okay, yeah, this is me hiding from the world. This is me not wanting to to deal with what's really up and not wanting to share or like we're not yeah. wanting to, you know, I know you and I have, have talked a little bit about depression and the yeah. fact that, that you've dealt with depression for many years. I've dealt with depression for many years and that can be a scary thing of like, oh, is this mm -hmm. depression again? Like, And so like if it's something that you've had in your past and you, and you have kind of a, a watchful awareness of not wanting to go there, do you particularly like do you have a way to check your motivation other than just asking the question? Yeah, that's where my husband, um, he's become my partner in that oh. respect. He, he's able to recognize the signs. And my husband's a very analytical person. So mm -hmm. in some ways, I'm lucky that he's very analytical in other ways, not as much. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, he's really able to pick up on, on the signs. And then he's learned through the years how to how to kind of broach the subject with me in a way that doesn't put me on the defense. So it's a very loving way that he comes, you know, and not everyone has that. And I would just encourage people to to try to find that. And, and I think that comes from opening up and, and letting people know, here's what I'm going through. Here's how I could really use your help. And when you're in the heart of that depression, it's it's near impossible to do that. And so when you're when you're out of it, that's when you want to be making those asks and and you know bringing a couple of trusted people along, um, yeah. along for the ride. I, I think I think that that that's really really important to have mirrors, somebody in your life who can who can ask you those loving questions and and allow you to to check in. Yeah, for sure. That's really super important. You also in our in our earlier chat catching up on on how things have been you mentioned that that things with your husband have not always been totally <laughs> rock solid and that this is a lot of like but connected with with uh, past yeah. issues and yet right now he's like a totally sounds like a totally solid ally so yeah. I, I know that like a lot of people out there struggle with relationship issues and certainly like our own dealing with our own stuff is of course like a, a huge piece of how we're going to show up in relationships. So mm. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit about, about your story and how uh, just like the interplay between the work that, that you have done on yourself and how that changed yeah. uh, w the dynamics between you and your husband. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to my childhood a little bit. Um, again, since since I can remember, which is about the age of eight, I've, I've put myself in this protector position, whether, whether I was or not, that was what I thought I was, was protecting my mom and my brother um, against my dad. And so I didn't grow up knowing what a healthy marriage looked like. I didn't grow up seeing people be kind to each other. Um, I grew up walking on, on eggshells and being told my dad would kill us if we left. And, you know, just really horrible, horrible things. And, you know, a lot of people experience a whole bunch of shit. So that's, this isn't about what I experienced really, but I didn't have those, those things, those anchors, those seeds planted when I was younger. And so when my husband and I, you know, were going through hard times, not communicating, I didn't feel like my needs were getting met, um, you know, all sorts of things. I defaulted back to what was normal for me, which was hide myself away, put up the walls, um, not say what I needed, not it just, I wanted to run and hide. I wanted to run away because I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know what that looked like so much more wrapped up in there. But really when I, you know, earlier I said, I finally came to grips that my mom didn't have my back. At the same moment, I realized it was like a, a light went on that my that my husband, he was the one that actually had my back. And, you know, it's that protector, that warrior, you're kind of this lonely hermit, if you will. <laughs> and, you know, and so part of it was just recognizing that I actually I wasn't alone, no matter what I had been telling myself. 
um, and that I could rely on this other person. And so, you know, and he's all along, he's been there to love me and support me in the ways that I needed. I didn't know what that looked like. It, it sounds like now you do. <laughs> being yeah. able to. Well, <laughs> it's kind of like night and day and I, I don't want to simplify it. I don't want to minimize it, but there reached a point where on my healing journey, I came to grips with some, some things inside and it, it's like it opened my eyes to a whole new way of thinking and approaching my life, my marriage, how I mother, how I mother myself, just, just all of that. And it's, you know, it's things come to a head and that happened to be my head. So, and you mentioned like the old childhood pattern of running and hiding. Yeah. Was, was that showing up in your marriage? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's my husband's biggest fear because he knows my tendency. He knows why. He knows that that tendency is probably never going to go away. Um, so that is his biggest fear. Going through the process of sharing with him what your history mm. has been and and working on yourself, like, did you have to upgrade your relationship commitments together about like, well, first of all, how yeah. were you hiding? Like, how were oh, you God. not showing up in the relationship? And like, what did what did you need to start doing differently? Yeah, I, I so... <laughs> There, there's lots of years here. Um, I went through a period of time where, you know, I had children very young and he's actually my second husband, but I had children very young. I grew up almost overnight and I'm not the type of person that ever wanted commitment or I, I didn't want to be a mother when I was younger. Um, and, and all of a sudden I was. And so I, my entire adult life has, has been this struggle, the yin, the yang, the, the push, the pull of... I love being a mother, but, you know, I love being a responsible adult, but so there was a period of time, probably three or four years where I would, I would travel with girlfriends and that was great. It was very healthy for me to get out and experience the world a bit and, and have some freedom and autonomy that I, that I hadn't had um, at, at, at any point in my adult life because I'd become a mom and a wife overnight. Um, but through that, I started it's like my body was at home, but my mind never was. My mind was always gone. I was never, I was physically there. I was not emotionally or mentally in my marriage, with my family, um, my job, any of that. And so it, it felt very much like this. I was le leading this double life and I always had something to look forward to, but it was never with um, the people that I loved. And, and so why, why didn't you just leave? <laughs> You know, um, I had left my first marriage and, and there wasn't shame around that, but leaving my second marriage, it definitely felt like there was shame. And I also, <laughs> I actually did tell my husband I wanted a divorce. Um, and I had gotten a, an apartment. I was starting to furnish it. I was still living at home and he knew, but we, we hadn't told the, the kids and we didn't want to tell them until they were done with school for the year. So I, months had gone into this preparation. He'd known for months. And I would tell people, like, maybe when we're 70, we'll get back together again. Like, I just want some, I want some freedom. I want some space. Maybe when we're 70, maybe we can buy houses next to each other. And I would go, <laughs> I, well, we laugh so it wasn't and it about... was funny. I would find stories. I would share actual stories with him of people who were doing that. You know, and so it was like, why can't we do this? Because I love him, but I, I love my family, but it was just all these buts. And, and where I was at emotionally and mentally, I wasn't able to see that he had my back, that, that he was my person to help me best heal. I knew he was an amazing father, an amazing person in general. He's a very interesting person, very funny person. I was like, maybe when we're 70, this will all work, you know? Oh. <laughs> and, but anyway, so I'll make it quick. The, we told our daughter and it was the most, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. She was 10 or 11 at the time. She's 13 now. And that night I couldn't sleep. I just, I could not sleep. And I tossed and turned and I woke him up in the morning. Like it was like my heart and my ego had been out of sync for so long. My ego was, had been telling me for a long time that this, I wanted to leave. I wanted autonomy. I want, you know, I wanted to run. And my heart finally woke up that night and said, no, that's not actually what you want. You haven't done all the work that you need to do to make your family be the best family it can be. 
What an awesome thing for your heart to say. Like that just, yeah, yeah because, it, because we can be, there can be unmet needs in any relationship, oh, totally. but, at, but there's totally ways uh, uh, most of the time of getting those needs met without having to, to get rid of the relationship itself. So, well, so your heart finally stood, spoke up. Yeah. And how awful to put my daughter and my husband through that. How awful. Oh, and at the same time, it's like you, you clearly wouldn't have done that if you had known yeah. what, what no. you knew that day. Right. You know, and like sometimes it takes, it, it, it takes, takes going, going right up to the edge of a cliff to realize that you don't actually want to jump, you know, like that there's, it's, that it's okay. It's, I'm wondering, Jen, if, if there's a connection between you having to be like having to adopt such a young persona, such a protective, independent, mm -hmm. um, that I, I got this and I, I that sort of <laughs> sort of way of being in the world that whether that whether that inhibited your ability to receive love and like whether whether that's something like you know as as your heart sort of realized like hey you've already got somebody who's gonna have your back and see it through it's like there sometimes I, I don't know this is this is just a guess but you know a lot of times like we look to the opposite we look to to kind of the that if you're amazing at of moving through the world in a way where you don't necessarily seem to to need that from anybody mm -hmm. um that if it's not part of your sense of self and then there's part of you that's like actually yeah no this is something that this is something that we can have this is something that is our birthright to be loved and to receive that yeah i, I mean you hit the nail, nail on the head and it, it actually has me tearing up because one of the stories i got from my mom was that i had a heart of steel you know, I think she meant it in a, in a complimentary way. And I never took it as that because... Oh, like you can endure, not right. like you're, you're a cold fish. <laughs> well, I think she meant it both ways. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so it was part compliment, part not. Um, yeah. But I'd had that story for so long. And it, it, you know, it melded in with the story of I'm not a kind person. People don't want to be my friend. I'm not a good person. Like it just, it fit in with all those other stories. And you know, she even warned my husband about me when we were dating. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> kind of screwed up. Um, so this heart of steel, again, I think my mom saw it as this inner strength. And I do have that. But what she sees is the emotional wall, the wall, because I have to do that. And that's so much of what my husband and other people were getting was this huge facade. My heart was, wasn't strong enough to weather the hurt if it, you know, if it happened. So I didn't let anyone hurt me. Like you couldn't hurt me. You could, but I told myself you couldn't hurt me. So I'm a very strong, independent woman. I pride myself on that, but I'm also incredibly soft and gushy. And it's really like those things that don't fit with our persona, our sense of yeah. self. Those are a lot of times like that's the secret shadow, right? Or the, it sounds like for you, a, a really long unmet need. Right, yeah, you know, to, yeah. to receive love, support, affection in an unconditional love kind of a way that parent loves a child and it, or yeah. the potentially or someone loves their pet in like an, yeah, yeah. If, if you're not a kid person. That sense of self, I mean, that's it is, you know, I, I'm coming into my sense of self. I'm 47 and this has been exhausting, exhausting work, but it's been worth it. And I know, you know, some people never, never get there. Some people get there much sooner. But, it's uh, such important work. In Chinese medicine, we have this notion of the five elements, right? Like wood, fire, earth, metal, and water as these constitutional types. And what I feel like is, is you know, kind of like any sort of personality test or strengths finding test. It's nice to know kind of what you are, but I think it's also mm -hmm. really interesting to notice what are the parts that just like don't describe you at all, because a lot of times the medicine is there, you mm -hmm. know, or like that it's, it's this idea that we all have all of the elements within us. And just because like some of them and some of them are just going to be like our innate, like what we came in with kinds of things, but other, other elements we develop strengths in because it's what was rewarded in our environment growing up, or it's what allowed us to survive in our environment growing yeah. up. And it's the kind of thing where like, all right, so you can maybe like overplay that element hand, like, and, and, and not really ever live into your full potential of what is possible for you to know yourself as, as a human being without exploring kind of these other parts of yourself. And if it's not safe to do that, like if you, you know, if, if it's like parting with a, with a long held survival strategy can be really painful and hard. 
So a lot of people don't ever want to do that work. Yeah, yeah. It's exhausting. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> this <And> is years. <laughs> The Basics of Chinese Medicine, Your Inner Ecosystem is an eight-week Learn From Anywhere course that will demystify acupuncture and Chinese medicine. By the end of the course, you'll be able to begin to align your lifestyle and diet with daily and seasonal rhythms so you can digest better, have more energy, and stay healthy, and determine which systems in your body tend to be out of balance and how you might tend to them with lifestyle, diet, acupressure, and more. Each week, you'll get 20 to 30 minutes of an audio lecture so you can listen in your car, at the gym, while you're washing dishes, or wherever. Fun quizlets, reflection questions, and exercises to reinforce the material you're learning. Plus, you'll get three 60-minute group phone calls with Brody so you can ask questions, discuss new concepts with classmates, and learn in a group setting. Go to BrodyWelch.com and click on Basics of Chinese Medicine under the Learn From Home tab to find out more. Classes start October 18th, so reserve your spot today. So, so why is it worth it to do it? Like for, for people who are kind of like, why do I want to go to the painful places? Uh, like I'm fine with just, you know, <laughs> like with my coping mechanisms as they are. Thank you very much. What's on the other side for people? Oh my gosh, that's that's a big question. Well, um, for you, you know, like yeah, you don't have to answer me. it universally. No, no, it's you know, for me, I spent so long feeling dead inside, and like it's just it's it's heartbreaking when I look back, and in that time, it felt heartbreaking. And so I could put up the facade, I could put on the personas that that I was a master at doing that, and I always felt dead. I didn't want to be dead, but I felt dead, and to me, that is. Like, why live? Why? I, I also don't want to bring that to my to my children. I don't want to bring that. It's, just, it's not fair. It's not fair to bring that into that energy into the world, I guess. And so for me, it was it's been this. I am going to figure this shit out. I don't care how long it takes me, but I refuse to be this vital person on the outside and dead on the inside. I refuse to do that. It's not fair to anyone, let alone myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, so, and it's just, so you know, glad you came to that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, raising, raising my daughter, again, she's 13 now, but it was just, I didn't want her going through. I mean, she, she's not going through what I did at all, but I didn't, I didn't want her raised by a, a woman who was checked out and feeling dead. Like that's, that's awful. <laughs> You obviously were not providing her with an abusive household, right. but you were providing her with with a model of how to go through the world yeah. with emotional walls up and without leaning on anyone and without my stomach just did flip flops. Like it, it kind of makes me nauseous. Uh huh. Um, but it is what it is. Well, it's and it's the kind of thing where that when you give yourself permission to show up authentically, you give other people permission to do the same. Yeah. And just what you said about being dead inside, I think, is so true, right? What's true for us, people talk about authenticity a lot. And for me, it's thinking about what is authentic. That's what's alive, right? Like the, yeah, that what is yeah. alive and vital is where your chi and blood is flowing. And if you're putting chi and blood you're this sort of into a, into a mask, into something that's not your actual being, it's exhausting. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's not only, it's not only inauthentic, but it's, it's actively an, an insult to your life force and to your, to your spirit. And it doesn't allow you to connect with the world in the way you're like, well, no, nobody's, nobody wants to connect with me. Well, the, yeah, because I you're not really why. showing them you, <laughs> you know, like. I'm saying all this in a really analytical sort of way, but but I, I hope that you can hear the care beneath oh, my words absolutely. of the fact that that's a monumental thing to do is to to be able to to take that mask off and to be willing to to be revealing about what actually is is true for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks for seeing that. You know, it was exhausting to be a certain way in the world, and the work is exhausting. But goddamn, I would rather feel than feel dead. Um, I'll yeah. feel anything besides dead. Amen to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm curious if you notice that the work that you have done on yourself and becoming aware of your stories helps you in the in your professional life. 
Yeah, you know, I have two sides to my professional life, the the software development side, which I've just always been the mama bear nurturer for my team. So I, I'd say not as much there. But in the this next iteration of myself in, in a more personal way, is wanting to be that emotional support system, that emotional sidekick, you know, kind of a wing woman, I, I love taking people under my wings. And you know, just helping be on that path with them, like give strength. Cause that's when I was going through it alone, I so desperately wanted this f feminine strength to kind of lean on. And I didn't have that. And I had to learn how to give it to myself. And that's great and good. But I, I can do that for others. And so I want to, I want to help people open up, share those stories that are harder to share, lean on me, get some of my strength and and again, it's very selfish because anytime I do that, I heal a little bit more. I feel a little bit less alone. And so I know that that's transferring to the other person or people. Um, and so, you know, that's why the podcast, eventually I do want to work with, with women that need that emotional support and maybe don't know how to get it because they've been hiding behind a mask for so long. Yeah. It's my favorite thing in the world, too, to see people be more of who they really are. It's just the best thing ever. And people a lot of times like that, you know, no matter no matter where you're getting that support from, it's like it's really helpful to have it. It's really helpful to have somebody hold up the mirror of like, actually, you know, like that you're so much more than you think you are. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, like like my husband, Jeremy, um, he he and I developed the 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 shorthand of the limiting beliefs buzzer. Ah. And so so like anytime he catches me in like some of my stories about not not being enough or like my I have a wicked negative self-talk um, habit that's really ingrained that I've been trying to break for years. And so like when I say something that's just old and outdated he'll just be like limiting belief and you know and he'll just like, like make a little buzzing sound and i'm like oh yeah right i get to update that file and it's like oh, it's it. super helpful to have somebody like in real time mirror back like right. oh yeah you don't actually need to be reinforcing that story because we are what you know like our, yeah. our minds believe what we tell them right i can find evidence that i'm a bad person and i can find evidence that i'm a good person um, and so it's, really, it's what, really what evidence am I choosing to look at? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Jen, if people want to connect with you, how do they do that? Yeah. My website is jenvertinen.com. Uh, inst Instagram is jenvertinen. Uh, I pretty much use my name on social media. So, <laughs> so you're easily findable. That's easily excellent. Easily findable. Yeah. yeah. And do you have one little closing tip you could offer up for people who want to bring in that self-mothering energy into their own lives? Mm. What's been so helpful for me is having my daughter and maybe not everyone has a daughter, but you know, a younger girl. And I would, you know, it's just checking in with your heart and asking, putting them in, in your place. What would you want for that person? What would you want for that younger girl? Whether it's your younger self, your daughter, your niece, what have you. What do they most need? And then how can you give that to yourself? That is the easiest way I found to kind of step into that self-mothering and asking, what do I need? And then being able to give it to myself because God damn, I'm not, I'm not keeping that from my daughter. I am not keeping love from her. Beautiful and ferocious. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, thanks so much for being willing to go there with me today. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to BrodyWelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.